Today's episode of the Finance Frontier podcast is with guest Ryan Sullivan. Before starting his own financial firm, Ryan was a highly successful mechanical engineer. For years in his late 20s, he grew an engineering department to over $1 million in annual recurring revenue. Now that Ryan is a financial advisor, he works mostly with clients who are engineers, architects, and building industry professionals just like he was. We talk all about this and how Ryan learned about personal finance and eventually started his own firm. Enjoy the episode. Thank you, Ryan, for joining me today. The first thing I want to ask you is what inspired you to become a financial advisor? Yeah, Yeah. so I have always been interested in finance and investing and markets and uh, done, you know, a lot of just building my own spreadsheets and tracking things. And, you know, over the last handful of years, just kind of uh, I had talked to some other financial advisors and a lot of them all gave, you know, really similar um, advice or suggestions. They all kind of said the same thing. And I struggled with that because I didn't really like fully agree with some of the things they said. And so I, I kind of I started doing things a little bit differently. And I met a, uh, a financial advisor in town um, who thought similarly to what I did. And so seeing that and realizing like, oh, there are people out there like that. Um, and that, that just are doing things a little bit differently that kind of helped was a little bit of the inspiration and so you know ultimately like it's always been just kind of a passion of mine something i've done something i spend a lot of time and energy with and the more i realized the, my level of knowledge uh relative to other people and how i can help them and seeing like the path forward with that and just doing things a little bit differently i uh, decided to you know ultimately take the leap you said it's kind of something that you've been passionate about since you were young Was money a topic that your parents talked to you about when you were growing up? Yeah, so I I don't have the best memory, like long term, you know, of my childhood and stuff. And so I, I, but my, I don't think so. You know, I I was trying to think about that and um, like money was talked about, but I don't feel like I really ever learned like very specific, you know, lessons or skills around that. It wasn't like they taught me, you know, good money habits or principles or tools to use with that. So a lot of it was just kind of like self-developed. And I think one of the the best examples, I don't know if you're a, a gamer at all, but when I was younger, you know, I used to play video games and there was this this one game where you had um, a, like a your belt held like potions. And so, you know, I was always concerned about running out. And so I had like my backup potions for my actual potions for my backup potions. Like I had all these tiers of like, I was really worried about like running out. And so I think that that kind of mentality is something that's held through through the rest of my life as well. I want to be very secure and I want to have stability and confidence and really just options as far as making decisions. And so I think that that a lot of people would would agree with that or that would resonate. And so that's kind of how I approach things is, you know, how can how can we create a foundation, a strong foundation and stability from your finances and use that as an opportunity to to really live your life the way that you want to. Yeah, I think it's important to form good money habits from a young age. And I'm curious to get your perspective. How can working with a financial advisor benefit a younger person? Yeah, I think, you know, historically advisors have been very focused on on the investment side and targeting, you know, retirees and people with, you know, higher levels of assets. And, you know, I think these days there, there's a huge demand because a lot of people aren't taught these skills. You know, there's not a lot going on in schools or, you know, families or parents aren't necessarily, um, you know, spending a lot of time educating their, their kids on how to have good money habits. And I think it's a pretty systemic problem, you know, in, in this country. And so what, you know, advisors today can provide, too, that are uh, they're more focused on on the planning aspect and those types of things, you know, there's opportunities to work with them that don't require as much in in assets. And so to me, it seems like if if finances aren't your strength, then you should probably, you know, consider working with an advisor because ultimately what you do with your finance is going to have a huge impact on the quality of your life and really what you're going to accomplish. And if you don't, if you struggle with that or it's not your strength, then there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, getting some support or having a resource, you know, just like in sports or business, you know, coaching or therapist or, you know, so many different things. Uh, it's really valuable to have a different outside opinion. And so to be able to have someone that has the skills and the knowledge, the tools to be able to assist you with your cash flow, you know, just getting things organized, making sure things are balanced, um, you know, getting you on the right track 
And putting that effort in early on uh, in your life can pay huge dividends because, you know, it's, it's the power, power of compounding, right? And so, you know, you make a little bit tweak in your 20s or your 30s, and all of a sudden, you know, 30 years later, that, that's going to be a big difference. And so I think there's actually even more reason to get started early on just because you have so much more time for that to have an impact and developing or establishing good good habits, good tools, good systems early on in your life will really uh, serve you well down the road. When does someone know they're ready to start working with an advisor? Yeah, I think uh, that question of, you know, is, is this my strength? Is this something that I'm good at? Is this something that I want to put time to? I think for a lot of people, you know, everyone has to deal with their finances. I mean, hopefully you get paid, you know, one way or another, you have some income, obviously you're going to have some expenses. And if, if you try and kind of avoid that topic, you know, if that's not really something that you like dealing with and you just kind of look at your bank account once a month or every two months or whenever you have to, you know, uh, or you're checking it every day because you're worried about it, you know, like both of those kind of extremes are, are not an ideal situation to be in. So, I think if, if you find yourself in one of those places and you just kind of know that about yourself, that it's not something that you really want to put a lot of energy into, I think that's a good cue to, to potentially look at having somebody come in to help you with that because it can have such a big impact on, on the quality of your life and what you can do. What are some of the most common misconceptions about financial advisors? Yeah, I think, uh, again, a big one is just, you know, only working with people that are either in retirement or close to retirement. Um, you know, I think another is is sales and commissions. And so one thing that I didn't even fully realize before I entered into, you know, the advisor world was just how many different types of advisors there are, because the word, you know, financial advisor gets thrown around a lot and it, it kind of has a fairly loose definition. And so, you know, there's um, there, there's lots of different ways that people go about providing or, or the services they provide with that. And so I think understanding the different types of advisors, really how they work, how they're paid, um, you know, what kind of their strengths and weaknesses are, I think is really valuable when you do start that search to make sure that your goals, what's important to you is aligned with, you know, the type of person that you're going to potentially work with. Yeah, I think that's really good, you know, general advice for choosing an advisor. And obviously there are so many options out there. I'm curious, how did you choose a pricing model when you were setting up your firm? Yeah, so when I was setting up my firm, you know, I, I really wanted to be able to cater the services that I provided and also the way that I was paid to what was needed from my clients. And so I, I intentionally left it uh, fairly diverse or flexible to be able to try and accommodate different situations and for whatever made the most sense. So there's a couple of different ways. Um, you know, sometimes just a, a one time, you know, kind of project based uh, service or fee, you know, makes the most sense. It's like, hey, we're going to work together for a couple months, you know, kind of get things organized, get things situated. And then, you know, good luck. And if, if you need some help down the road, like, great, we can we can go from there. Uh, but there's no you know, sort of ongoing commitment. Um, you know, also do a both like a monthly or quarterly um sort of ongoing, you know, planning option. And so that's specifically focused on like financial planning aspects, whether that's, you know, goals based, um, you know, tax planning, uh, you know, looking at some different insurance stuff, uh, you know, business planning, uh, you know, a handful of different things with that. And then I also do investment management. And so I separate that out as a standalone thing. And that uh so basically i kind of separate into those different categories and that allows me to sort of align the services i'm providing with the way that i'm compensated and that way it's it's very clear and transparent i guess as far as what you're getting and and what that's costing yeah it sounds like you took a really unique approach to setting up your firm and really focused on being very transparent with how you make money um, and how you charge clients the next question i have for you is a little more personal I know you're calling in from Montana, but I'm curious, where did you grow up? Yeah, so I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and uh, I came out to Bozeman, Montana for, for college and fell in love with, you know, the mountains out here and, uh, you know, everything that Montana has to offer. And 
So I didn't want to leave, uh, which I think is a pretty common common theme with people that come out here and ended up staying. And so I've been out in Montana now for, uh, I think about 13 years. So Yeah, it's a beautiful part of the country. Um, you know, definitely I would recommend if you haven't been to Montana or Wyoming or Idaho, really a beautiful part of the country worth visiting. Is there somewhere else that you've traveled or something that you've done that you would highly recommend other people should do in their lifetime? Yeah, so I was thinking about this question and I'm going to say, you know, if you haven't climbed a mountain, you should climb a mountain. And that could be a lot of different things. But I think ultimately something that, you know, really kind of challenges you and pushes you. And I've done, you know, quite a few 12 plus hour days in the mountains of, you know, some just long, arduous slog. And you really learn a lot from those experiences. And I've tried to take a lot of that, that just kind of the things I've done in the outdoors and kind of translate that to, you know, business or life or other different things. And, you know, when you're, I don't know, six, eight hours in or whatever, and you're pretty tired and you don't really want to keep going, but, you know, you drove however many hours to get there and then you've been hiking for that long. It's like, are you really going to stop, you know, before you get to the top? And, you know, so I think just learning like some of those kind of skills or just the mindset mentality behind, you know, pushing through when things get hard and, uh, you know, challenging yourself. And that's a big thing for me. I love the combination of like the physical and mental challenge tied together. And so rock climbing is a lot of that of like just overcoming fear. Same thing with, you know, skiing and stuff like that. Um, so I would really encourage people to get out there and, and climb a mountain, uh, you know, and if, if you live in Florida and it's only like a little hill, you know, maybe, maybe that counts, but something that really pushes you both mentally and physically. So switching gears a little bit, I, I know that most of your clients are either engineers, construction workers, architects, and professionals in the building industry. Could you describe a little bit about what's most important to your clientele? Yeah, so so my background is in the, the building industry. Uh, you know, I'm an engineer. I've uh, been an engineering, you know, managing a department for the last handful of years. And um, so I have a lot of, you know, relationships and just connection with, you know, people in that industry and understand how it works, understand, you know, the challenges they run into and, um, and just, you know, spent 10 years basically in that field, you know, doing that. And so when I set out to start my firm, that it became pretty clear early on that like that was the, the type of people that I was familiar with working with, that I was used to working with, and that I felt like I could serve the best. And so that's kind of how I came to focus on, you know, working, you know, primarily with architects and engineers. Is there a theme that you've noticed when talking to your clients that maybe is like a difference between that group of engineers and architects and, you know, professionals in the building industry? Is there something that's different about their needs than kind of the average client? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, a big thing is just the way that, you know, they communicate the, the environment that they're in, um, you know, and just, you know, kind of the personality types like that. So, you know, architects, engineers are both can be extremely detailed and, you know, ask a lot of questions, really want to understand things. And so I think that's important from an advisor's standpoint to be able to, to field those questions, to make sure that, the you know the client fully understands you know what they're doing why they're doing it how it works all those types of things if if that's what they want and so i think that's part of it you know beyond that a uh, big thing i see which i think is you know kind of uh, outside of just that industry but in general is just uh, a lot of times disorganization you know when it comes to people's finances and so i think just getting kind of clarity transparency having a, a system in place i'm really about you know systems and automation and I don't want you to have to worry about your finances at all, right? Like I want you to be able to just know that you're on the right path and on track. And I think a lot of times, you know, architects, engineers are, are pretty focused on their career, their projects, um, you know, what, what they're doing for work. And sometimes, you know, their finances and those types of things can be kind of on the back burner. And so I think helping, you know, put something in place that makes sense to them to be able to streamline that and make a, a, a good quality system that puts them on track on the right path to, to their goals and objectives is really important. Um, the other thing I'd say too, is there are some things, a lot of uh, firms use what's called uh, ESOPs or employee stock ownership plans. And so that's a pretty common uh, thing that we see out there. 
and you know understanding how those work the benefits of them uh, how that relates to the rest of you know your financial picture i think is important to to evaluate and so there's a lot of you know small firms out there and so that's another thing too uh just with when you have these you know small businesses you know one two five maybe ten you know people uh there's some different things that kind of come up from that especially when you're starting to look at you know ownership or partial ownership uh those types of things yeah, I'm sure it really makes a difference that you were an engineer. So you have that lived experience and you can kind of better serve your clients because you were in their shoes one day. So, you know, the next question I have for you, if you can put yourself in the shoes of 20 year old engineering student, Ryan, what would be some advice you would give to your 20 year old self? You know, I, my, it's funny. My mom, uh, when I was going to school, she was like, you should take a business class. I was like, I don't want to take business class. You know, I'm an engineer. Like, why would I do that? And, you know, I'm not sure what that would have done per se, but, you know, it took me a little while to discover, you know, kind of like entrepreneurship and, and business and finance. And for, for me, at least, you know, there's this whole other world. And I just hadn't really known that it was out there. And so I think, you know, a big thing for me was, and, and I'm sure it's just a thing as you go older, you know, and when you're young, you, you only know so much, but kind of broadening my horizons. Right. And so I just, there's so much out there in this, in this world. And I feel like in college and stuff at that time, like it was pretty focused on like, I'm just going to be an engineer and I didn't really know what that means, but that's just what I'm going to do. And it wasn't until I got into that world and learned more and saw other things that I really kind of figured out, Oh, like, there's a lot of ways this could go and there's nothing really set in stone. And I think probably the biggest thing, you know, that I've kind of learned is just nothing is really set in stone, both for you and for everything around you. And so whatever you really want, you know, you can make happen if you want to, if you choose to put in the time and the energy to do so. And so I think having that realization, you know, early on is pretty powerful because it, it puts you on the path to be able to pursue things and kind of removes those limitations. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing I would say is like, don't feel like you have to be sort of pigeonholed into this one thing because that's what you studied in college for, you know, or got a degree in, or that's where you've been working for five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, you can always reinvent yourself. You can always start anew. And finding something that really aligns what you're passionate about, what your where your energy goes, and finding a way to basically, you know, live a life with an abundance of that, I think is really key. Wow, that's really powerful advice. And it makes me wonder, at the age of 20, did you ever expect that you would become a financial advisor or a financial planner? No, definitely not. I mean, even even like two years ago, I where I wasn't even thinking about it, you know? Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. You know, life is always throwing surprises at us. And it's interesting to hear your experience and how you became a financial advisor. The next part of the podcast is a little bit different. We actually want to take a quick look at a post on Reddit. This one, it's a quote, and maybe you've heard this. $75,000 is a baseline for happiness and emotional well-being. This Redditor that posted this says, this is a lie. I've seen this statistic pop up occasionally over the past three years. And when I made under that amount, I believed it to be true. But moving to a $90,000 job a few months ago, I can say my happiness and emotional well-being has not improved, and I still struggle with financial anxiety. It feels like a constant battle with the rising cost of food and housing, and I sometimes wonder if I'll ever feel comfortable. So I'm curious, what do you think about that kind of like baseline for happiness and emotional well-being? Yeah, you know, I think... It's a good question. And I, I think that the most important thing for people is to really have a, a system that's working for them, right? And I think where a lot of people, the reason why finances are, uh, you know, provide anxiety or make people stressed or, or nervous or anxious or any of those things is because they don't really have confidence in their situation or what's going on, right? And so that could be for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I think, I think having, having a, a clear path and an objective, objective, you know, um, so I guess, I guess kind of goals, goals, you know, you have to have goals, goals you have to know where you're at and you have to, in order to figure out how to get there. And so when you take the time to really sit down and figure that out, and if you're not on the right path, well, then you probably should be a little worried about it, you know, like you got to do something different. 
Um, but if you are on the right path, well then great. And if you don't know what the path is, well then that's a problem too. And so I think most people don't take the time to really develop uh, a plan for themselves to have uh, you know, system and automation in place to, to minimize the effort that's required of them. And, and they really don't have clarity or transparency into their financial situation. And so all of that leads to is kind of confusion or uncertainty, which ultimately leads to, to stress and anxiety. And so I think it doesn't really matter how much income you have. Uh, what matters in my mind is if it's balanced. And so one thing that I do a lot of is I talk a lot about cash flow and I, I work really hard to help people balance out their cash flow. And again, it doesn't really matter so much what the income or the expenses are per se, just as long as everything balances. And so, you know, you want to make sure those are in alignment with your overall goals and objectives. But the first question is like, if you add up your income and you add up all your expenses and like, what does that look like? And if you're going backwards, you know, if you're spending more than you're bringing in, well, like that's your first problem. And so I think there's, uh, you know, a couple of different ways to really approach that from kind of more of a tactical standpoint that can help people minimize the, the anxiety or the stress they might feel related to their finances. That's a really good answer. Just kind of like taking inventory of where you are now, where you want to be in the future. And it's okay if your income isn't what you want it to be, but just figuring out, you know, how can I work towards a, a higher income or a higher net worth? So thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really thoughtful. I'm also, you know, going off script a little bit, you've mentioned like automations a couple times. So I'm just kind of curious to get your, your perspective on maybe the most common automations that you feel like are useful to your clients or people you talk to about investing. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I've kind of developed uh, what I call is kind of the path. Um, you know, my firm name is Off the Beaten Path Financial, so it's kind of a play on that. But uh, and it's it's a cash flow strategy. It's it's um, I mean, it's nothing crazy per se, but I think the implementation of it can be really powerful for people that haven't done something similar in the past. And ultimately, the automation I'm talking about is primarily just uh, you know automatic transfers. And I think a lot of people like to have their money primarily centralized in you know, a single account or two accounts, maybe just a checking and a savings. I really like to segregate things out. And so I like to I have a saying, uh, you know, every dollar has its place. And so you need to make sure that you know where every single dollar that comes in is going and it's intentional. Because if it's not intentional, chances are it's gonna go wherever. Like you probably don't know, or if you do know, maybe it's not where you want it. And this is um so so when you really sit down and you, you kind of break it down and, and part of my system we kind of create what i call buckets uh different categories for things to go into and you sort of allocate a percentage of your income to those places and you know when that's in alignment with your goals like you can be confident that you know that if you do that you follow through on that it's going to take you to where you want to go and then from there you know it's kind of segregating the money into these different accounts that each have their own objective and so you know every account has a different goal it has it's it's used differently and there's um so it's it's in a different place or has a different asset allocation or you know whatever and then from that point you can just automate these transfers every month and you kind of map it out and so that's one thing i provide for my clients is kind of a map uh that shows you know how all the money kind of flows to do these different places as well as a way to basically track that and know that you can pull up, uh, you know, your bank account on any given day and know exactly, you know, how many dollars you should have in there. And if you don't, then you know, hey, something's not right. I'm off track. Um, but if it matches, then you're good to go. And so back to kind of peace of mind, I think it's a it's an amazing tool for people to be able to uh, feel confident in where they're at and that things are going properly um, by kind of breaking those things down. I appreciate you sharing that too. Uh, you know, I know I don't mean for you to give away any of your secret sauce <laughs> at the beaten path, but I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so, yeah, yeah. you know, the last question I have, which again, going off script a little bit, I'm just kind of curious if there's any like media that you listen to a lot, if it's a podcast or you're, you know, a, a bit an audio book or a book you've read recently that you might recommend to others. 
Yeah, um, you know, a, a big thing for me, I guess, I, I've, what really, what, what got me to where I am now uh, was, you know, my interest in, in finance and markets. And so a big resource for me has been a platform called Real Vision. And uh, they do have some, some free stuff or you, you have to pay to become a, a member or subscriber. But, and, and it's, originally it was primarily geared more towards professional, you know, investors, but they have, I remember when I first started listening, like, I understood like 20% of what they were talking about. <laughs> um, but over time, you know, over several years, like now I probably understand like 80% of what they're talking about. Um, and so that's been huge for me to, to really understand, you know, markets, the dynamics of that, you know, um, and, and all those types of things. And so, they also have a lot of resources for you know kind of newer uh investors uh, as well as you know a forum and stuff like that and so they're they're definitely uh working towards you know more accessibility to people that are that are newer to that to understand um but if you enjoy kind of like the technical side of it you enjoy understanding how things work what moves markets all of that they have a lot of great resources um and different you know podcasts you know forums publications other things like that so thank you for sharing those ryan we'll be sure to link those in the description below the last thing i'll ask you what would you like to plug where can people find you your website twitter social media yeah um website a great place to start it's uh you know obpfinancial.com uh, i'm also recently active on twitter at uh, investor solely uh linkedin as well um and so you can just search for me ryan sullivan uh in bozeman it should come up there and yeah well i also have a newsletter uh it's called the trail report and so i send out you know periodic uh just kind of things i found interesting or you know links to my different blog posts and stuff like that that i'll post uh or podcasts or other stuff i've found um, and you can check that out on my website. There's a link to sign up for that as well. So thank you, Ryan, for joining the podcast. Had a great time talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Drew. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It's great talking with you.